Hello everyone and welcome to the History and Game Slap podcast. We have an online book launch event for Lion Rampant, A Viking in the Sun, which we launched at Leeds. And I will be your host for tonight, Edward Gafton. I am part of the lab itself. And I am joined by Gianluca Rakani, uh, Dan Mercy, and James Holloway, all of them being creators of the book itself. Um, so... Before we get everything started, I need to let you know that this is going to be the first ever time we ever do a live stream event in this in this manner, in this fashion. So I do expect there will be some visual audio hiccups. It is the second try we've, second time we've tried this. First time was unsuccessful, but we should be fine now. Um, and I see comments, so this looks pretty good on my end. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to have talks for all, all three of our orders, starting with Dan, then with Gianluca, and then with James. And at the very end, we will have a Q&A session for all of us uh, involved with the project. Uh, I will be reading your comments and reading your questions throughout the session anyway, so do feel free to point it out if something goes wrong, if you would like to leave a note to me or to uh, members of the panel, and I will read it out. Uh, and then, yeah, in any case... Um, we do look forward to hearing from you. This will also be um, uh, saved into posterity on YouTube. This will become a recording. Whether or not it will be the live stream on a separate recording, that remains to be seen on the quality of the recording. We're still experimenting with stuff on that front. But uh, this being said, Dan, if you would like to start, you have the floor. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, so, Line Rampant, published back in 2012, and it's proved to be a popular set of medieval wargaming rules. It's been genuinely delightful to observe the number of gamers who've embraced my game, and hopefully they've had plenty of fun in the process. When I began working on the first draft of Lion Rampant, I had in mind a simple set of wargaming rules that could be used for none too serious gaming evenings. Gameplay was stylized, and the rules were stripped back from the usual complex clauses to offer up a streamlined game that would not require too much flicking through the rule book during play. Most gamers who have tried the rules get that. Most like it, some don't. I rarely hear from the players who have enjoyed it, but often hear from those who haven't. But that I think is just the nature of creative industries. What is often overlooked though, is that I was also trying to design a game that really captured the flavor of small medieval battles and skirmishes. The rules were as influenced by Hollywood history as they were by real life, but at their heart, I wanted to portray fairly realistic, small unit medieval battles. Linked to this, I've always tried to encourage gamers to research their subject matter and tweak or expand the rules I write to their own liking and to better represent their own vision of an era. Part of this vision is to produce armies and modified rules based on their own historical research. You may, of course, build one of the sample retinues from the rule book, but it's much more fun if you read up on your chosen army or your leader um, and build your army based on that research. Working with the University of Edinburgh as their game designer in residence gives me a formalized way of helping others to do this and to help non-gamers see how their academic research can be used to promote historical gaming. Behind the simple gameplay of Lion Rampant, I carried out a lot of historical research and uh, did a lot of theorizing. Um, so I've been doing this for 25 years or so. It's second nature to try to make a historically themed game actually feel somewhat historical. Part of the process of streamlining the rules was making deliberate decisions as to what to keep and what to leave on the cutting room floor. In the end, historical research usually informs my games less than the nuts and bolts of the rules mechanics but it is there, bubbling away in the background. I'm not an academic, nor am I at the forefront of historical research. So working with the university allows me to bring together those who are and help make my rules more historically rigorous. My involvement as a hobbyist game designer, working alongside gamers and non-gamers at the university, offers them insight into game design, applying their historical, knowledge, knowledge, historical research in the industry's commercial environment and helping to shape the output into a viable gaming project. It's been a fantastic learning curve all round for me. Um, I've never been knowledgeable about the Crusader campaigns or Harold Hardrada, and I've gained so much insight as we develop these books. 
Um, in return, I hope I've offered the university students, gamers, non-gamers and enthusiastic newcomers something in return. It's been wonderful to see so many different medieval retinues being collected. Medieval gaming has seen a renaissance, if, if you'll excuse that word here, um, in the years since Iron Rampant's release due to several popular rule sets being published and some lovely new ranges of medieval miniatures. The second edition of Lion Rampant will stretch the time frame further back towards the fall of Rome, so I'm anticipating seeing a variety of Anglo-Saxons, Norse and Arthurian player armies in 2022. Which brings us on to the Harold Hadrada supplement, which we're celebrating online today. It's there. First of all, congratulations to everyone who was involved in the project, whether their role was large or small. The book looks great, and just like the Crusader State supplement that preceded it, the historical content is both knowledgeable and relevant to gamers. This is very important to me and something I could have not have achieved by myself. The scenarios and new rules add period flavour and depth to the core rulebook, and everyone involved should be very proud of their contribution. The high percentage of medieval war gamers know the name of Harold Hardrada as the king who lost at the Battle of Stamford Bridge in 1066. A much smaller percentage of medieval war gamers knew anything about Harold's earlier life before the publication of this new supplement. And, and this is something that has impressed me greatly in the university's approach. We're carving out our own niche here, knowing that a well-produced project will bring gamers to lesser known campaigns rather than just relying on revisiting the old faithfuls of, of medieval wargaming. Looping back to my opening comments, Lion Rampant was always intended as a game that touched upon history, rather than as an exact simulation of medieval warfare. But I also hoped it would be um, used by serious gamers who wanted a simple set of rules with just enough historical detail to scratch their itch. I think the University of Edinburgh's History and Games Lab blends these two goals very well. These projects hopefully help gamers to understand history better than they did before and offer university students and academic departments a rare opportunity to interact with a commercially successful industry, even when that industry involves toy soldiers. Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the lunch. Uh, thank you, okay. Dan. Yeah, and then uh, yeah. Now, Gianluca, we can proceed with uh, with your talk. Ah, perfect. I will um, introduce briefly myself first because uh, I'm not as well known as uh, uh, Dan among gamers. Uh, my name is Gianluca Racagni. I'm a lecturer in medieval history here uh, at the University of Edinburgh, and I'm the director of the Eastern Games um, uh, Lab here uh, at the university. So my research interest is. Um, the medieval world in the high middle ages um, especially uh, italy western christendom and now the mediterranean uh, which is why the first uh, uh, two expansions uh, of lion rampant uh, have dealt with uh, high medieval uh, high medieval topics essentially um, i thought today uh, that my role was to um, talk about the history uh, um, that informed um, La, um, Lion Rampant, uh, um, a Viking in the Sun. Uh, so I have a brief PowerPoint presentation also to show the connections with the Eastern Games Lab and with the research that, that we are conducting here uh, at Edinburgh. Let's see if I can share my PowerPoint. Okay. Coming up. He's thinking about it. Yeah, he's, um, he's not the first page, though. Ah, here we go. Um, so we knew that there would have been some uh, itches for some reason now. Okay. Absolutely. Always expect uh, prepare for technical difficulties of some sort. 
Yes. It is very slow. He's thinking about it. Uh, OK, that is not the first page. OK. OK. Yeah, well, whenever you're ready, you can you can go if it looks good to you. Um, yes, for some reason, it's showing only the text and not the images around the text. And it yeah. was working fine when we tried it. it, it I see, I see, I see some images on my end. Yeah, it all looks fine to me. Yeah. Okay. In... Okay. So, um, I thought to start, uh, uh, by, um, spending a few words on the, uh, history and, uh, Games Lab. It is a research group here at the School of History of the University of Edinburgh. And it essentially has two aims. One is to study how history is portrayed uh, in uh, uh, games and how to gamify history, essentially. And as you can see from this uh, um, slide, um, we have uh, we organized a series of activities uh, and, uh, and events. Uh, including playtests, uh, talks, uh, uh, and we have this YouTube channel that we are using at, at the moment. But the Eastern Games Lab is also a game design studio, little game design studio in its own right. Uh, you can see here some of the games that we have uh, uh, tested, especially in, in, in the central image, you can see a um, little mega game that um, um, Gordon Smith, uh, who is here in the picture, um, uh, represented doing a, a game master. He designed it for uh, one of my classes on the Crusades. Uh, and uh, on the left, you can see the uh, cover of uh, Lion Rampant, the Crusader States, which was our first experiment of this kind uh, together with Dan. Um, so uh, I've always been interested in gaming and uh, to, what ex to, to some extent, uh, uh, gaming uh, uh, brought me to uh, study history and then to do it uh, uh, as a profession. And a few years ago, uh, we met when I invited Dan after I discovered Lion Rampant here to Edinburgh to talk about uh, how to gamify history. So we had the idea of um, um, uh, experimenting uh, with game design and producing the Lion Rampant the Crusader States uh, together, because at that time, my research project was about the Italian city republics and crusading. Uh, I was interested, I was writing something about uh, uh, Italian colonies in the uh, Holy Land, especially the town of, of Gibele or Biblos. Uh, and uh, so that uh, then led, I expanded that to cover the whole of the Crusader States. That experience was very enjoyable and was very well received. So um, after we published that, we thought to repeat the experience. And uh, that was led us to, um, to uh, Harald Aldrada which is essentially a prequel and an offshoot of uh, Crusader States. So while I was doing my research on the Crusader States, uh, on, on, sorry, on the Italian city republics and crusading, I started to write a chapter on uh, their involvement in crusades in southern Italy. And uh, I was looking at the, where to, when to start, basically. I was going back in time uh, to see where, uh, where to start the project. So they... I considered for a while the Norman invasion of uh, Sicily, the conquest, in the second half of the 11th century. And that already had uh, crusading features, even if um, it was uh, done and dusted before the first crusade. Uh, but then I thought, so where does this start? And, uh, and then I came across the Byzantine invasion of Sicily of 1038. And that did not have any crusading feature. Uh, so I thought that that was something that I would not include in my research on uh, my, my project on the Italian city republics, but that was something that it was interesting to explore in its own right. Uh, that is the Mediterranean as it looked uh, before the Crusades, um, which is something that is often overlooked. People are, are attracted by the Crusades for um, uh, perfectly good reasons, uh, very interesting. Uh, episode in the history of the Crusades, but I wanted to, to see how uh, the Mediterranean looked on the eve of the Crusades, just before the uh, expansion of Western Europe that led to the Crusades. 
And uh, while looking at the invasion of Sicily, I uh, came across again uh, Aral Aldrada uh, because he was uh, a very prominent uh, uh, participant uh, in uh, that uh, invasion. And uh, uh, because one of the sources of that invasion is, is Saga. It's not the first time that uh, um, my, my first uh, encounter with Harald, um, I, I had that book on Harald Saga for 20 years. Um, so it refreshed my mind and I met him again. And um, that book, reading that book, basically we gamified um, the sections of that book that dealt with the Mediterranean. To the point that the cover of uh, Lion Rampa and the Viking in the Sun is directly inspired by pa a passage from uh, the saga. Uh, I can read it to you and uh, you can uh, see the connection if you look at the, um, at the cover. So uh, this is the passage of uh, Harald's saga written by uh, a poet of his court and then uh, copied by Snorri Sturluson in Iceland in the 13th century. Uh, is a passage about his arrival uh, at Constantinople. Bleak showers lashed dark, dark prows hard along the coastline. Iron shielded vessels flaunted colorful rigging. The great prince saw ahead the copper roofs of Byzantium. His worn breasted ships swept towards the tall tower city. So we took that as an inspiration for, uh, for the very cover uh, of, uh, uh, the, um, of the game. And as James will uh, mention in, in, in a moment, uh, um, our, especially our um, scenarios are all based on primary sources. Gamify uh, passages from uh, medieval chronicles and sources as we use them, uh, we use this passage for, for the cover. Uh, but um, uh, why was interested to, uh, in exploring Aral Aldrada in the Mediterranean? Well, Aral Aldrada, as Dan, uh, as, Dan as already mentioned, uh, is already very famous. And you can see here a selection of uh, biographies of Aral Aldrada that are currently available on the market, including on the, on the right, uh, the um, very fresh uh, new one uh, published by Osprey. But uh, they tend to focus uh, not exclusively, but uh, they tend to focus on uh, uh, the uh, later period of his life after he became king of Norway. And um, because of these, because our, our attention has mainly been created by his invasion of England and his death at the Battle of Stamford Bridge in 1066. His very name shows uh, this focus on his later life very well, because he was known, uh, he was not known as Ardrada when uh, he, he spent uh, uh, a few years in the Mediterranean. Aldrada means hard rule and uh, is a nickname that he acquired after he became king of Norway because of his style of uh, governance, uh, essentially. And uh, all the surviving in medieval images of Aldrada also derive from uh, that later part of his life. And so you can see here a coin struck by himself, so that is a we can describe it as a self-portrait, uh, wearing the jeweled crown of Norway. And in the background, you can see some illuminations from uh, the life of King Edward the Confessor, written by Matthew Paris, an English monk in the middle of the 13th century. And they represent the Battle of Stamford Bridge, essentially. Harald is the one with the battle axe. Uh, but um, his uh, um, life in the Mediterranean uh, I thought that it was a, an extremely interesting topic to explore because uh, it is uh, uh, unique in many in many ways and uh, is a stream of interest as well, even if it has been uh, so far completely overshadowed by his later exploit in Scandinavia uh, and uh, uh, in, in England. So uh, the, the game, so while I was designing the game, um, also I had the idea of launching uh, this project, this academic project. So the game itself inspired now uh, a, uh, an international and multidisciplinary research project, uh, which is similarly entitled The Viking in the Sun, Harald Aldrada and the Mediterranean on the Eve of the Crusades. And uh, the rune stone that you can see here in the slide has become almost like the symbol of um, 
uh, of this new academy project because it represents uh, someone who it, it commemorates someone who, who probably died uh, uh, while fighting for Harald uh, in uh, in the Mediterranean in uh, Lombardy. So he says, Inga raised this stone in memory of Olaf. He plowed his stern to the east and met his end in the land of the Lombards, which he referred to southern Italy. So Harald, uh, and that, 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 that runestone is from Sweden and is from the early uh, 11th century. And Harald spent uh, um, eight years, roughly, uh, in the Mediterranean between 1034 and 1042. And here you can see both the chronology uh, of Harald, uh, formative years in the Mediterranean and his travels. Uh, so he left uh, Scandinavia around 1015, uh, sorry, 10, 1030. He spent a couple of years in Kiev and Rus, and I will go back to that in a second. And then he uh, joined the Varangian Guard uh, of Byzantium uh, and uh, in around 1033, 1034. And then he fought on all the borders of the Byzantine Empire from uh, the Middle East, Anatolia, and then uh, he went to the Holy Land uh, to, and then uh, uh, and he also fought in the Aegean. He took part in the invasion of Sicily uh, in 1038. He fought in southern Italy as well, in Apulia, against the earliest part of the Norman uh, conquest, what later became the Norman conquest, because then it, it, it took a few years for the Normans really to, uh, to, uh, to, to conquer the uh, to, to conquer southern Italy. Uh, but Harald also fought in, uh, Bul in Bulgaria, in, uh, in, the, in the Balkans. Um, and then he returned to Kiev Rus, uh, uh, and from Kiev Rus he went to Scandinavia to, uh, re to gain the uh, crown of Norway. But if he became king of Norway, he could do that because of the uh, treasures, reputation, and experience that he gained in the Mediterranean uh, and uh, uh, serving the uh, rulers of Byzantium for those um, uh, eight years, around eight years. So he became king of Norway in 1047, and then 20 years later he died in England. And um, here you can see on the top left is a 12th century image uh, representing the Battle of Stiklestad. He was 15 years old when he joined his brother Olaf, um, the king of Norway, uh, in the fight uh, at the Battle of Stiklestad against uh, some rebels, uh, Norwegian rebels, and uh, um, we, we could have a uh, we could have a meeting just on that battle. But uh, bottom line, Olaf was murdered. Uh, Olaf died during the battle, and you can see here an angel carrying. Uh, so Olaf dying, and an angel carrying his uh, his body as if he was a, a little baby out of, into the sky. Um, you can see uh, on the right an image of King Olaf because then he was canonized and he became the patron saint of uh, of Norway with a distinctive battle axe, uh, which is a symbol also of um, uh, uh, attached to Harald. But in this case, you can see uh, a battle axe on a, on, a, on a patron saint because it was, uh, according to tradition, the weapon that was used to kill him. And saints, usually martyrs, are represented with, uh, with uh, the instruments that were used to kill him, to kill them. And um, Harald was injured during the Battle of Stiklestad. He was only 15 years old, uh, but he managed to escape with uh, some of the supporters of his brother, managed to take him to an isolated farmstead when he where he recovered, and then he went to in, in exile uh, to Kiev Rus. And um, uh, I'm particularly interested in Harald because uh, essentially he became a kind of um, uh, cultural frontier uh, crosser extraordinaire. Um, it is extraordinary because uh, of the reputation that he gained and the great experience and because he's very well documented. But uh, um, on the other hand, he was not a, a pathfinder. It happened to be a particularly well documented uh, a, a frontier crosser. But what he did was uh, to follow the Viking diaspora. And you can see here a map uh, in the center uh, of the with all the arrows of the Viking diaspora. And when I say for cultural frontier crosser, you can see bottom left, uh, that is a map with uh, 
from the late 11th century, but um, essentially it shows some of the religious frontiers of Harald's time. So he moved from uh, Scandinavia, uh, which at the time was divided, uh, was uh, a kind of um, frontier region of uh, Western Christendom. Uh, Harald was Christian, as is uh, brother Olaf, uh, but some of the people who uh, uh, killed his brother at the Battle of Stiklestad were pagans. So Scandinavia had converted to Christianity, or at least the rulers had converted to Christianity, uh, the generation before, uh, essentially a couple of generations before uh, um, Harald. And then from there he moved to Kievan Rus. Kievan Rus was not Western Christian, but was Eastern Christian country, again of recent conversion. So Christianity had uh, started to expand in Northeast uh, Europe uh, in uh, very much in, uh, in the century before, uh, before Harald. So Poland, um, Sweden, uh, and Norway, Hungary, they were all, uh, the rulers had all converted to Christianity uh, the generation or so before, before Harald. And the same applied to Kievan Rus. But Kievan Rus had not joined Western Christianity, but Eastern Christianity. And there are, in medieval Russian chronicles, there are, uh, there, there are, there is, uh, this very entertaining story about the Grand Prince of Kiev wanted to uh, convert from paganism to a monotheistic re religion and inviting at the court representatives of Judaism, Islam, Eastern Christendom and Western Christendom who pitched their religion to him and he eventually uh, chose Eastern Christendom because uh, he thought that uh, he, he, he liked the ritual and uh, the architecture. Basically that's what he uh, um, the primary chronicle of Russia says, while he thought that uh, Western Christendom was dull, essentially. But we shouldn't overestimate the differences between Eastern and Western Christendom at the time. Um, they, it was still considered to some extent just one uh, religious body, even if you know there were already differences that were uh, emerging between the two. Uh, but in the, in, uh, uh, in the eight years that uh, Harald uh, spent in the service of the Byzantine rulers, he then uh, traveled across the Byzantine Empire and even uh, then went to the Holy Land which, uh, and Sicily, which at the time were under Muslim rulers. Um, he encountered both Shia and Sunni Islam. And uh, these were not necessarily military clashes. Well, because in Sicily, we have an invasion of Sicily by the Byzantines, but in the Holy Land, as I will mention in the second, it was uh, a uh, diplomatic mission that was supported by the Fatimid authorities uh, in Egypt. Um, so, um, and also in the Byzantine Empire, he met various branches of Christianity. He fought alongside Armenians and Paulicians. Paulicians were uh, an heretical group that had been accepted by um, by the Byzantine emperors in exchange of military service, essentially. So the Mediterranean that Harald encountered was a Mediterranean in which Western Christendom played uh, a very minor role at the time. So in the map that you can see here, it is a map of uh, the Mediterranean after the Norman conquest of Sicily. And uh, the Reconquista in Spain has already taken momentum. But in reality, when Harald arrived in the Mediterranean, only southern France, uh, Barcelona, and northern Italy belonged to Western Christendom in the whole of the Mediterranean. So there were two great powers in the Mediterranean. One was Byzantium, and the other was Fatimid Egypt. And uh, they controlled uh, roughly half of the Eastern Mediterranean each. But also the central Mediterranean uh, paid allegiance to them. There were uh, smaller principalities in southern Italy and uh, in modern day Tunisia uh, that recognized the superiority, uh, those in Italy, of um, the Byzantine Emperor as those uh, in Sicily and Tunisia of the Fatimid Caliphs of, uh, of Cairo. Um, and then we have the uh, then Western Mediterranean uh, with Al Andalus. Um, and uh, uh, the area of Morocco that were more, uh, they were too far uh, from the Byzantine, uh, from, from the Fatimids. But generally speaking, the two main powers of the, of the Mediterranean were the Byzantine Empire and uh, um, 
uh, and in uh, Fatimid Egypt. And Fatimid Egypt was, uh, uh, again, um, a very cosmopolitan society. So the Fatimids were Shia Muslim, uh, but uh, there were plenty of Sunni Muslim uh, in the territories that they're controlled, uh, especially, for example, in uh, uh, the central Mediterranean. Uh, and uh, also they had a lot of uh, Christian subjects um, as well. Uh, to this day, there is a very strong religious uh, Christian presence in, in Egypt. So, um, but the first uh, um, non-Scandinavian country that uh, um, Harald encountered was Kieva Rus. So Harald decided not to travel to the Mediterranean following the western route from Normandy. Um, there were really, the, the Normandy was uh, created by um, Scandinavian conquerors, of course, and um, they had already started to uh, the Normans of, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to travel to southern Italy. So by the time uh, he, uh, Harald arrives in Byzantium, there are Norman mercenaries active in southern Italy, but they're only acting as mercenaries under uh, um, uh, the local rulers. So he moved east probably because Normandy was blocked to him by uh, the op opponents and enemies of his brother. And he, he traveled across Kieva Rus, which was, can be described as the Normandy of the east. Uh, the rulers of Kieva Rus were also Scandinavian origin. And here you can see the ruler uh, of the time. So all of these images are contemporary to, uh, to Harald. Yaroslav the Wise, uh, holding the church, which looks a lot uh, in that uh, draw drawing as, the, as, it stand, as it is now. And it's a church that uh, is called the Saint Sophia because uh, it was modeled, it was um, uh, the name that uh, was taken from Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. And you can see also a seal of, um, of Yaroslav and his tomb. Um, Yaroslav not only uh, uh, gave hospitality to Harald, uh, but he betrothed his daughter, Ezif, to him. And essentially, he is the one who is responsible, according to the saga, for uh, Harald's travel to Constantinople, because basically Harald asked him a, uh, in marriage his daughter, and he said, uh, I cannot give you in daughter uh, in, in marriage my daughter because you know, you're an exile without money, without a reputation. You need to gather money and reputation first, and then we think about it. Why don't you go to Byzantium, uh, where already there is a Varangian guard established by, through an agreement between uh, um, uh, the uh, predecessors of Yaroslav and the Byzantine emperors. So from there, he, uh, Harald moved to the Byzantine Empire. And, then, and, and uh, as I said, he traveled across all the borders of uh, that empire, uh, which at that time was at the, at the peak of its medieval success. Um, Byzantium uh, is an empire, very long, uh, thousand years old empire by the time it fell in the 15th century. And uh, in, during the Middle Ages, it had, uh, you know, um, uh, good periods and bad periods. It, uh, uh, the, its territory um, sh uh, shrunk and, uh, uh, and, th and then uh, it was recovered uh, several times. Uh, when Harald arrived there, uh, it was at the end of, of the peak of his success after the death of uh, Emperor Basil II, the Bulgar slayer. Uh, Basil had... Uh, Conquered lands in the Bo in the in the Balkans uh, and uh, and the Middle East as well. So it, Byzantium reached the uh, the highest extension uh, at the time uh, of its medieval existence. And here you can see a selection of uh, Harald uh, the location visited by Harald. So we have uh, Constantinople, it means walls, Hagia Sophia. On the top left, uh, you got Edessa in Upper Mesopotamia, uh, which later became a Crusader state. And uh, on the bottom half, you can see the, uh, an island in the Aegean and uh, uh, the Danube in Bulgaria. And here you can see some of the artifacts uh, uh, from Harald's time. Uh, so on the top left, uh, uh, we have one of uh, Charlemagne chess pieces, um, but he's a misnomer because in reality they were produced in southern Italy in Harald's time. On the top, you can see uh, Harald uh, employers, the rulers of Byzantium, 
And it's important here to underline that according to the saga, his employer was not Emperor Michael, but Empress Zoe. So he was a mercenary of the Empress. And uh, the sagas is interesting the way they portray his relationship with Zoe. Um, the saga claimed that uh, uh, Zoe fell in love for Harald. Harald did not uh, uh, fully reciprocate. Um, but we know that uh, Zoe had the quite open marriages. Uh, the, uh, her consort uh, that you can see here on the mosaic is uh, not the one that uh, her consort in our time, but her third husband. Um, and basically each husband were a former lover who then became an hus uh, a, a, the, her husband when the uh, previous husband died. Uh, but the mosaic, the, the body that you can see of her consort is of her first has of her first husband. Uh, but then every single time that she had a new, they changed this, the face. So at the moment, that that is the third husband that uh, she married uh, around the time of Harald when Harald left Byzantium. Um, underneath, you see a Byzantine, what is generally considered the Byzantine representation of uh, Varangians with their axes and blonde hair. And at the bottom, you can see a mosaic from the Imperial Palace of Constantinople. And Harald might have well walked on it. It's a floor mosaic. Um, and uh, a 12th century representation of uh, um, illumination from uh, a Byzantine uh, chronicle called uh, Skilithis, who talked about uh, also the events uh, to which Harald took part in the Mediterranean. But Harald, as I mentioned, uh, uh, took part in several campaigns and missions around the uh, Mediterranean. And we cover three, two of which are uh, uh, taken from his saga, King, uh, King Ara's saga. And the other one is not, but uh, I'll go back to that in a second. This is covered uh, um, quite substantially by his saga. And it is uh, um, Harald armed pilgrimage to the, to the Holy Land. So sometimes Harald is described as a proto-crusader because he, had an arm, he led an armed pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Um, but, uh, and that, to some extent, we could say that he was, because uh, an, a, a, a crusade is an armed pilgrimage. But Harald was not there to conquer the Holy Land or to restore it to Christian rule. He was probably, um, he was probably providing military escort to a pilgrimage slash diplomatic mission by the Byzantines that was particularly aimed at rebuilding the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, which had been destroyed by the Fatimid uh, um, Caliph Al-Hakim uh, during persecutions in 1009. Um, and you can see here the map uh, of, um, of um, the Holy Land as it, as it is now. Uh, the saga mentioned uh, uh, how uh, Harald <clears throat> visited Jerusalem and then went to the River Jordan to bathe in the River Jordan, uh, as pilgrims used to do in the Middle Ages and to this day. Uh, and uh, according to the saga, he fought against bandits, not against the Fatimid authorities. So the Fatimid authorities, uh, um, well, they, the saga doesn't mention that, but the saga mentions that uh, he fought against bandits, which means that the Fatimid authorities were supporting uh, the diplomatic mission. And in fact, in our campaign, this is one of the 30 campaigns um, are already supported by, uh, by the Fatimids, who also provide uh, a military uh, escort. And you can add you, uh, Fatimid units. So the image is here. You can see the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And the one that you can see here is essentially the church that was rebuilt by the Byzantines after Harald missions. So, so he went there with some surveyors and architects who started to re rebuild, to build what you see now which was not essentially changed that much by the Crusaders or after that. Uh, and um, after, under it, you can see uh, the location where Harald based in the uh, Holy Land, because that is where pilgrims went. And um, beneath, beneath that, you can see uh, an image of the Judean desert, uh, which he had to cross if he was traveling from Jerusalem to the uh, River Jordan. And here, uh, when I look at it, I think about the culture shock uh, that Harald must have uh, experienced because he came from Norway. Imagine, you know, moving from uh, the fjords of Norway to a very harsh desert that essentially 
looks a lot like the planet Mars. Um, and also, uh, he, uh, uh, he probably um, ate bananas there. So you, I don't know if you ever thought about the Viking uh, eating bananas, but the bananas were grown there uh, well before our, our time. And we have uh, a lot of reports about uh, Jericho, which is close to um, the River Jordan, uh, as a major center for the production of bananas. But our uh, campaign here is a series of, uh, 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 of um, encounters with the bandits of the area that also allowed us to, uh, allowed us to explore the very rich history of uh, banditry uh, in the Middle East at that time. Uh, after that, um, he took part in the invasion of uh, uh, Sicily. So we didn't cover uh, his adventures in, uh, in the Aegean Sea, but because we have very little evidence in the saga uh, regarding that, uh, but we have a lot of it uh, regarding uh, the Byzantine invasion of Sicily. Uh, James will go uh, into that in a second uh, uh, regarding uh, the ways in which we gamify that. Uh, but you know, there is a substantial chapter in the in the sagas ab about his uh, his Harald um, uh, participation to the Byzantine invasion of Sicily. Now, Sicily was originally Byzantine land, but you know. That applied also to all the Middle East. But Sicily had been lost by the Byzantines uh, fairly recently. And the Byzantines were keen to get it back, especially since the western uh, side of the island was uh, um, populated still by Greeks, uh, Christian Greeks. And uh, you can see uh, the uh, uh, Mount Etna. Uh, and uh, I thought to show it. Uh, here and on the book, because both, the, the whole of the eastern side of the island is dominated by Mount Etna. You can see it from uh, uh, most of the eastern side of the island. So Harald constantly fought under, you know, uh, he, he, uh, under the um, Mount Etna. You can see it even from Syracuse uh, in good days. Um, and uh, the image on the bottom right, that is an image of the uh, of the walls, ancient walls of Syracuse, and uh, uh, they st still stand today. And uh, Harald must have taken part in uh, in the siege of Syracuse, which I like to describe as a kind of uh, a Sicilian medieval version of the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, because those walls are a bit like the walls of Minas Tirith, uh, and the battle was fought within those walls. Uh, they are uh, it's very, a very long cycle of walls, one of the longest in the Mediterranean world, comparable to uh, Constantinople, even, you know, they are larger than Rome. And they were built by the Greeks, so before the Romans. They were already centuries old, many centuries old. Uh, I think almost uh, a thousand years, uh, uh, more than a thousand years old by our time. Uh, while on the top, you can see uh, one of the locations that is Rametta, uh, where uh, um, uh, one uh, battle to which Harald took part uh, uh, took place. And uh, as James will mention in the moment, most of the evidence from the saga is about Harald uh, besieging towns that probably looked very much like the one of our image here, including the church, because the church pre-existed the, the Muslim conquest. So Harald might have well visited the church that you can see there. It's the Byzantine church in Sicily. The third uh, uh, campaign, however, is uh, about southern Italy. And this is not mentioned in the, in the saga. Uh, well, we know that he was there because there is one line uh, in uh, uh, the Morkin Skin, which is a different work, not uh, uh, King Aral Saga, which is in Heims Kringler. So the Morkin Skin says only that it has one line saying that Harald disturbed the peace of the Franks. Which might have, we could have only happened during uh, the Norman invasion of um, Apulia. So these are very beginning of the Norman conquest of, Cis of southern Italy, 41, uh, around the 1040, 1041. And uh, basically, it happened that uh, during the invasion of Sicily, Harald fought alongside the Normans, uh, but the success of the well, um, uh, the temporary success of the initial success of the 
of the Byzantine invasion of Sicily meant that quarrels uh, then arose uh, regarding uh, the, um, the spoils of war and especially with the Byzantine commander. The Normans quarreled with the Byzantine commander, Georgios, Georgios Maniakes, uh, and he's a character in our book, and, uh, he, and, they, and they returned on the mainland where they joined a rebellion against the Byzantines. Uh, so eventually the Byzantines had to pull their troops out of Sicily in order to counter the Normans in Apulia. And here again, you can see some of the uh, locations uh, related to Harald there. Uh, you can see on the top the Mount Vulture, which is where Harald, next to which Harald fought the, the first couple of battles against the Normans and the Lombards. Um, on the bottom, you can see the town of Melfi, which is where the Norman conquest started, where the rebellion started that eventually led to the Norman conquest. And on the top right, you can see the Palatine Chapel of the Dukes of, uh, of the Princes of Salerno, uh, the Lombard Princes of Salerno. Southern Italy was uh, fragmented into a lot of petty principalities who uh, paid uh, Norman mercenaries as, uh, as um, their uh, um, elite troops to fight each other, essentially, or to fight the Byzantines. Uh, but eventually, the Normans... Uh, after the initial success of the rebellion against the Byzantines, essentially took over and one by one conquered uh, each of those principalities. And that one is a church again called Saint Sophia from Salerno, uh, because this, the beauty of these uh, uh, principalities is that uh, uh, they were a kind of buffer zone between uh, Eastern Christendom, Western Christendom, and Islam. So this is uh, the Palatine Church of, uh, of Salerno, not far from Naples. The Palatine Church was basically a Byzantine church dedicated to St. Sophia, just like Hagia Sophia in Constantinople. But the princes of Salerno had also uh, Saracen troops, and uh, they struck coins that uh, are basically a reproduction of Islamic coins. Um, at the same time, they were Lombards, um, they were descendants of the Germanic barbarian uh, invaders of Italy. Uh, they had Germanic names like Gisulf, uh, and, uh, but they spoke Latin. So I always find, found that uh, area uh, especially fascinating. Uh, so we have included that in uh, our, uh, as our third, third campaign, which it was not reported by the saga, sagas because it was an utter disaster for Harald and the Byzantines. They lost every single battle. Uh, Harald survived, uh, fortunately, um, and he was taken, he, he was transferred to the Balkans where, to, where, to, where he had to fight another rebellion against the Byzantines. At the time he was extremely successful so far as um, uh, in that period he, when he returned to the Scandinavia from uh, the Mediterranean, he was not called Arald Rada, but he was called the Bulgar Slayer, the Bulgar Bar Burner, essentially, probably copying the Byzantine Emperor Basil II. So essentially, that is the three are the that is the historical context of our game, which is now leading to a proper international, as I said, research project. We are using uh, it, in, it was all inspired by this game. So while we were designing this game, uh, um, originally it was to be linked to uh, just one article that I was writing on the reasons why the Byzantine invasion of Sicily was not a crusade. Uh, but uh, um, while writing this, uh, designing this game, uh, I, I thought that Harald could become a, a very interesting case study for a reassessment of the Mediterranean before the crusades. Uh, exploring also uh, his links, uh, the links between the Mediterranean and uh, Northern Europe and the Atlantic. Uh, and it is a project that uh, is starting, is starting uh, now and will continue for the next few years. So uh, hopefully it will inspire uh, uh, sequels uh, to uh, our work uh, on uh, Harald Aldrada. But uh, let's see how these things, uh, these things go. Perfect. That's all from, from me regarding the historical background of our game. And uh, now James will talk about uh, the ways in which we turned this history into a game design. 
Whenever you are, whenever you are ready, James, you may begin. Okay, just give me a second, and I'm just gonna you uh, kind of bring up my uh, my presentation here. Yeah. In the meantime, everyone, uh, just to let you know that we will be taking questions at the very end uh, for all three of our talks, all three of our sections. So do stay on for those. And yeah, James will be delivering a talk on how we turn history into game design, which I think is is very interesting. All right. Can it, uh, so uh, we're ready to go. If you're at, uh, have you shared your screen? Uh, yes, I think so. Uh, it's not popping up on my end. Oh, hang on. Nope. Give me one second. No worries. I knew I would do something wrong. Here we go. And... The, if if you have more concerns about the actual logistics of the of the stream, do let us know. How's that I'll, one? Yeah, we are looking good now. Fantastic. Okay. So um, apologies for the delay there, everyone. Um, so uh, yeah, um, my name is James Holloway, and uh, I am the other co-author of Line Rampant, A Viking in the Sun. Um, my background is in archaeology. I, I studied archaeology. I got my PhD in archaeology. Um, but uh, my role on this project is, uh, I mean, it's a, well, I mean, everyone does everything, but my background that's relevant to this project is more specifically in game design. Um, I've, uh, I've written for um, uh, a lot of uh, sort of historical gaming projects, um, including things like uh, Cthulhu Dark Ages, um, the upcoming uh, Trophy Loom, um, and uh, projects like uh, Knock Magazine um, and Dissonant Whispers. Uh, and I'm the host of uh, an RPG podcast, Monster Man. Um, and so what I wanted to talk about today was now that John Luca has given you some of the uh, historical background that inspired this project, I wanted to talk about how we took that historical background and turned it into uh, the game itself or the game supplement itself. Um, so when I knew that I was going to give this talk, I started out by asking people what they'd like me to talk about. Um, so I asked my, you know, social media followers for questions about historical game design, and they give me a wide range of different answers. Uh, but one of an those answers was obviously the most common, you know, so it wasn't like it was the, the largest single category of answers or of, uh, of, of proposed questions, I should say. Um, and so if you take a look at these comments, uh, you'll see what they were concerned with. So this first person said, you know, uh, do you find the need to deviate from historical accuracy in flavor in favor of playability? How far are you willing to deviate and why? Someone said, you know, the, the where does the need to be a workable game override historical considerations? Someone else asked about the idea of historical accuracy and authenticity. What extent of the game is realistic? How do you ensure game balance while also honoring the historical nature of the games? Um, so a lot of the questions were concerned with what the askers perceived to be a tension between good game design and accurate history. And I want to suggest that this is not actually a limiting tension, but it's actually a constructive tension. Um, first off, I want to talk about this idea of accuracy or authenticity, right? What, what, what do we mean when we talk about accuracy and authenticity in historical gaming design? Uh, because those are very debated concepts. What does it mean for a game to be historically accurate? Um, I think most people in day-to-day -day conversation use those two terms, accuracy and authenticity, interchangeably. Um, but within the world of, say, historical fiction, they're used slightly differently. So when we talk about historical accuracy, we are talking about fidelity to actual events. So this person was in such and such a place at such and such a time, and they did such and such a thing. Whereas uh, historical authenticity could be applied to narratives that feature fictional characters, but within a setting that is based on history. So, um, you know, an example would be something like I, I don't know, a, a Bernard Cornwell novel, right? Like there was no Richard Sharp. So we cannot say that these books are historically accurate in that sense, or at least not those bits. Uh, but are they authentic is the question that we could ask ourselves. 
So obviously when we talk about gaming, we can't be accurate in the strictest sense because gaming implies some form of player agency. Um, if the player is going to get to make choices about what Harald does, then the possibility must exist that the game Harald does something that the fictional Harald or that the, the historical Harald, haha, I'm going to come to that point in a second, um, that the historical Harald didn't do, such as, you know, die. Um, but, and so that I think is, um, you know, most historical games are aiming for what we might call historical authenticity. So if you sit down and play a game of, you know, a World War II war game, I would say that for most war gamers, they are not, although this does happen, but most people aren't attempting to refight a particular battle and particularly not to refight it exactly the way that it played out. Although you might test a game by seeing whether it could produce precise historical results. In general, people are happy to have the right kind of tanks and the right kind of uniforms and the right kind of landscapes, but not necessarily concerned with like exact fidelity to historical events. But I want to go a little further and suggest that I'm not 100% sure that exact fidelity to historical events is really a thing. Um, I feel like this idea of historical accuracy presupposes that there is this account of history uh, that, uh, you know, that gives historians a precise knowledge of the events that took place. And then we have to decide whether to adhere to it or deviate from it. And maybe that is true for some periods of history. Um, as an undergraduate, I remember, you know, reading detailed, almost hour by hour accounts of modern historical events or, or minute by minute even. Um, you know, the, so something like the Cuban Missile Crisis is recorded in exacting detail, but that's very much not true for the period of history that we're approaching in this book. So in order to be concerned about being accurate to or deviating from a particular set of historical events, we would first have to have much greater confidence in those events than, than we actually may. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about why that is in, in a moment. So, and I want to suggest that this question is much more challenging in game design than you might expect because game design asks people to provide specific answers to questions that historians just aren't really in the business of providing specific answers to. So if you are, you know, writing a game set in a particular, you know, I was, uh, I, I, I wrote a, a thing set in medieval Antioch and I had to ask myself the question like, well, how many people lived in, you know, 13th century Antioch? And the answer that any historian will give you about that is, that's an interesting question. You know, there are different ways that we can try to calculate that. And we have to, you know, we, we know that maybe there were this many on this date. And of course, as a designer, you're not, you're looking for answers rather than questions. Or are you? Let, let, let's, let's put a pin in that. Okay. Um, to illustrate my point, I'm going to use as an example, one of the three short campaigns that appears in Lion Rampant, A Viking in the Sun that John Luke just mentioned earlier. Um, and that's campaign number two, which covers the Byzantine uh, invasion of Sicily, uh, which began in 1038. Um, and uh, I chose this one because as John Luke said, it's the one that is covered in the most detail by Harald Saga. So the, the, I mean, and that's not necessarily very much, but it's the most. Um, it's based on uh, on those extracts from the saga, but also on some other things, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, each scenario is based on a different extract from a different source. Well, some two from one source and one from another. Um, and then there is some scenario specific rules content, but typically not very much. Um, you know, if you've read Lion Rampant of Viking in the Sun, you'll see that the sort of um, the balance, I think, in each scenario between historical background and, you know, game mechanical content is, is pretty heavily tilted in favor of historical background, um, which I think is typical for uh, Lion Rampant, which is quite a rules light game. 
Um, and like I said, it begins with historical background, as you can see in this page uh, from the book, where we're talking about the historical background to the invasion of Sicily. So what are our sources for this campaign? Um, well, there are a couple. Um, the main one for this campaign, although not necessarily for the other campaigns, was Harald Saga. Um, and again, as John Luca mentioned, this exists in sort of multiple versions. The most famous one is the one that appears in Heimskringla, which is a collection of uh, sagas of different kings of Norway. But there are earlier versions uh, in, in other manuscripts, and they are quite different in some ways, even though it's been suggested that uh, at least one of them may be by the same author, um, the Icelandic uh, politician and Oh boy, everything, um, Snorri Sturluson. Um, so the, the the version that we're going to focus on for this is the version that exists in uh, Heimskringla, but there were cases where we went to the other ones to find uh, stories that don't appear in the, the sort of the best known uh, example. And um, there may be a reason for that. Um, so... These are, you know, although people often read the sagas as if they are strictly like detailed accounts of life in the Viking Age, in actuality, Harald's saga is much later than um, Harald's adventures. Again, as John Luke mentioned, um, the, you know, he's he is at this point a historical figure far in the past to the author. Um, and many of the accounts of Harald's exploits in uh, Harald's saga share elements with other sagas or with uh, literary works in other genres. Uh, I'm going to point out an example of that one when we get into one of the later scenarios. We also have uh, the account of the invasion in the, the Byzantine um, Chronicle written by John Skalitzis uh, that, uh, that John Lincoln mentioned. Um, this gives more detail on the invasion, especially in terms of its political context, which is more what Skalitzis was concerned with. We don't get a, a whole lot of detail um, of uh, of what's going on in Sicily itself, although there is some, but there's also a lot about the, the, the motivations of the different parties and their relations to each other in, in terms of the politics of Constantinople. What this chronicle does not mention is Harald. In fact, there's, I think, only one Byzantine source that actually mentions Harald or Araltes as it calls him, um, which is a text that was probably written by someone who actually served in the Byzantine invasion and may therefore have known Harald personally. Um, and I should say that that's not unusual. In fact, Harald is one of only a handful of Varangians named in a Byzantine source. So there's a lot of going on in you know Byzantine histories about the Varangians and the great qualities of the Varangians. But in terms of detail about individual Varangians, it's much less uh, much less uh, to work with. Then we have Old Norse poetry, like the passage that John Luca quoted. These were composed during Harald's lifetime. Indeed, some of them uh, are attributed to Harald, and then later incorporated into the saga. And in many cases, the sort of narrative of the saga may be based on the extant poems. Snorri's particular area of interest was poetry. And so that was what he was very concerned with preserving. So he may indeed be writing whole incidents in the saga solely based on the fact that he knows there's a poem about this thing. Um, Harald was himself only kind of an okay poet. He actually makes, um, uh, in, in the earliest in his life, but not earliest in real history, uh, uh, Harald's story, he makes a cameo appearance at the end of um, the Saga of the Sworn Brothers, where he completes a, uh, a poem spoken as a more famous poet is dying. And even then, in this almost certainly fictitious uh, incident, it's only okay. Um, but there's a lot of poetry in the sources. And of course, that's wonderful because it is our closest source to Harald's lifetime. But the downside of it is that, I mean, they're poems, they're poetic. They're full of imagery and veiled references. Old Norse poets, very big on uh, references that test your knowledge, um, but short on specific detail. And then finally, we have our contextual knowledge. So, you know, what we know about the Byzantine emperor, 
the Byzantine Empire in general, what we know about the history of Kievan Rus, what we know, you know, things that are not specific to Harald, maybe even not specific to these events, but they help us understand what we can consider to be plausible and what not. So we have this patchwork of sources, and it's not really a question of prioritizing one over another, but of looking for the inferences that we can make from all of them. Um, so in order to turn this mixture of different source types into a scenario, um, we begin by selecting possible source extracts, um, uh, sometimes referred to as gobbets after the, uh, the distinctive um, uh, history exam question type. Uh, where uh, where you know candidates are asked to like uh, analyze a, a a short piece of uh, of a text uh, unappealingly referred to as a gobbet, um, and uh, and then we choose these extracts based on a number of criteria. So this was particularly challenging for the Sicilian campaign, and I'll go into some more detail about that um, in a moment. But one of the things that we're looking for is variety, um, and uh, another thing is you know things that illuminate a broader historical context. So, you know, is this, first, is this potential scenario, you know, exciting and enjoyable in its own right? But secondly, is there a broader point that we can make arising from it? And then, of course, because this is a creative work, there are, you know, aesthetic factors that go into it. So you're certainly going to find, you know, I, I, I did, like, the Sicilian campaign is the one in this book that is sort of most uh, my baby, I guess. And I, you know, I will absolutely own up to including things in it just because they, they seemed appealing to me. And uh, I'll give a good example of that in a moment. Um, so let's start with an example of one scenario. This is the first scenario uh, in the Sicilian campaign. Um, and it covers a a uh, Byzantine ship being uh, driven ashore and the uh, the shipwrecked uh, crew having to, you know, fight their way clear of defenders to, to reconnect with the main invasion force. And although this is set during the invasion of Sicily, is not actually based on an incident that occurs in Harald's saga. Um, it was inspired by uh, a later incident that happened in I mean, allegedly happened in the late 11th century. And this is from the Alexiad, the history of the reign of uh, Alexius Comnenus, written by his daughter, Anna. Um, so this is supposedly something that happened in the 1080s during the uh, Norman warlord Robert Giscard's invasion of uh, Byzantine territory in what is today Albania. Um, and uh, I chose this because looking at Mediterranean naval warfare, I so... I knew that I wanted a beach landing scenario to begin a campaign that's about the invasion of an island, right? It seems dramatically appropriate, if you like. But resisted landings in medieval naval warfare seem to have been pretty uncommon. Um, it just wasn't really how naval forces operated in the Middle Ages. It's not like a bunch of, uh, you know, Viking longships or even Byzantine uh, naval vessels, which are a bit more technologically advanced, are going to be, you know, anchored off the shore, laying down suppressive fire. So, uh, you know, when encountering resistance on a beach, uh, a naval force would typically just, you know, sail away and land somewhere else. So looking through the available incidents, I found this one that comes from the Alexiad. And um, it, it, this is a big quote. It's not necessary to read the whole thing, but um, I chose it for two reasons. The first is that, um, as you can see, it's a very like complex and exciting incident. So um, uh, Bohemond and his ships are being pursued by the Venetians, who are acting as Byzantine allies in this case, says um, the Venetians took fresh courage and carried on the battle with greater energy until at last they routed the enemy and pursued them to Robert's camp. So they, uh, they, they actually have to run ashore and, um, and they are chased all the way back to the camp that is besieging the city of Dyrrhachium. Um, when Paleologus, that's the commander of the city's defenders, saw them, he too rushed out from the citadel of Dyrrhachium and fought on the side of the Venetians. So this idea that the besiegers are now being attacked by naval forces from one side and by the defenders of the city from the other, which I thought was pretty appealing. I also chose it because uh, of this bit at the beginning. Um, 
at daybreak, Bohemond came demanding their acclamations. So Bohemond is demanding that the Venetians uh, recognize a probably spurious candidate for the imperial throne. But when the Venetians laughed at his beard, he could not stand their ridicule and led the attack against the largest of their ships. And I, I fully admit to choosing this, at least partly because I like the idea of the battle starting because they laughed at his beard. Um, so the 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 main points that I wanted to, to, to make here were, you know, first I wanted to convey this uh, broader point about naval warfare, you know, to, to, to give an example of um, uh, a, a naval conflict that is rooted at least in the 11th century, even if not specifically in the career of Harald. Um, I wanted to uh, have varied settings in the campaign. I was very conscious that all of the incidents in Harald's saga that are about the invasion of Sicily have urban settings. And I didn't want all three scenarios to be set in the same kind of landscape. It seemed like one ship's worth of uh, attackers would make a good size of force for the kind of scale that Lion Rampant uh, typically deals with. And it seemed like uh, it would be tactically challenging for the, uh, for the players. Would you hold on for, sorry, just one second. As always, working from home has its particular yeah, sorry. challenges. Hang on, just, just one second. Did you look at any insight on goals for, this, uh, for the scenarios? Uh, on the goals for the scenarios? Um, I mean, e each one of them had different uh, uh, victory conditions. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, okay, so next up, I, I want to take a look at another scenario that appears in the Sicilian campaign, um, which is the final scenario in the campaign. Um, and this one is based, again, on an incident from Harald's saga. Um, and in this incident, Harald fakes his own death in order to be uh, let into the city, right? He's, he's besieging a city. He can't get in uh, by assault. So instead, he pretends to have died. And because everyone knows that the body of the great Harald will bring pilgrims and, and, and gifts from, you know, noble uh, donors, the various churches and things in the city um, sort of almost compete to uh, to see where he will be buried. But of course, he's not really dead. And when the Varangian funeral procession enters the city, it's a ruse and they capture the gate. Um, and this is a great, you know, this is a great image. Um, it's, there's a number of problems with it, which we'll talk about in a moment, but I knew that I could not do an invasion of Sicily uh, scenario based on Harald's saga without, you know, probably the most famous incident in that part of the saga. But did this incident actually happen? Um, no. I mean, I feel pretty comfortable saying it didn't. We know that this same story appears in other medieval texts um, about other people from uh, from earlier and contemporary periods. Uh, the same story is just told about lots of other characters. There's even a, a, a TV version of it, like this. So you can see this image from the TV show Vikings, in which um, uh, Ragnar Lothbrok, uh, you know, fakes his own death and pretends to convert to Christianity because he, unlike Harald, is a pagan, and then you know jumps out of the coffin brandishing his axes. Um, and in the Chronicles, the story is told about um, Ragnar's possible son, um, Bjorn Ironside. So like these, this is a story that's told about multiple people. Um, and it, it relies on stock narrative elements that are kind of hard to imagine in... I mean, Sicily was controlled by Muslim rulers. That doesn't mean that there weren't active churches uh, at di in different points on the island, but... It also seems a little bit overstating the case that the half brother of a failed claimant to the Norwegian throne would necessarily attract a lot of pilgrimage. Because, of course, this story is being written much later when Harald's association with St. Olaf would be very valuable. But Olaf's only been dead for a few years at this point. It's certainly the cult of his saint has not spread to Sicily. So this story is almost certainly fictitious. 
but authentically medievally fictitious. Um, so given that it's probably fictitious, why include it? Um, there were several reasons. The first, the first is that it suggests what, you know, Harald, how Harald is typically portrayed in the saga, right? That he's this strategist, a, a wily leader who uses trickery and deception to defeat his enemies rather than just like fighting ability. Um, and I, I like this in particular because the sort of common stereotype of Vikings is as unstoppably ferocious warriors. And that's the image of Harald that appears in the best known piece of Harald's saga, which is the Battle of Stanford Bridge, where Harald uh, goes fighting mad. Uh, but I, I, I suggest that that's meant to, to represent the fact that he knows he's about to die, and that this is more characteristic of how the saga portrays Harald in general. Secondly, although I don't think that this story is true, I do think that it represents a, a real tactical problem, the challenge of capturing fortified towns, which is something that turns up in other Old Norse sources discussing the Mediterranean world. Um, they're quite impressed by how urbanized and fortified medieval landscape or Mediterranean, excuse me, landscapes are. Um, and that is also consistent with what we know about the invasion, which is that it took a very long time, and also about later campaigns in Sicily, such as the Norman conquest. And finally, the incident features relatively small uh, force sizes and a decisive action that takes place in a short period in a, uh, you know, in a relatively limited location, which again makes it a good match for the available scale of line rampant. Um, and one thing that we do in this book, which I think a lot of historical war games uh, don't do, but maybe should, is talk about the veracity of the sources. Y you will frequently see these kinds of um, medieval literary tropes being repeated in wargaming texts as if they were facts because they appear in medieval chronicles. But that's not really how medieval chronicles are written. Um, so it's some, something that we talk about uh, you know, ho hopefully enough to get the reader thinking about um, the, the challenges of using and interpreting these sources. Okay, so having looked at these two examples, uh, I want to now bring you back to that first question about playability and accuracy. Um, and I want to suggest that this dichotomy, this division between playability and accuracy, obviously it is possible to I, I, I guess I'm going to say is I don't want to confuse the idea of accuracy or authenticity of re representing things that are or could be real um, historical events with modeling them in detail. Um, but I think that the, that the question in general is premised on an understanding of historical knowledge as a fixed and immutable thing that historians have a complete command of, which I don't think is an understanding of historical knowledge that many historians would agree with. Um, you know, in fact, historians don't just relate accounts of the past. They, they take evidence and then they attempt to create plausible interpretations of that evidence. But they would be the first to tell you that these are interpretations and, you know, the first to tell you that new evidence could change it or that the same evidence could be interpreted in multiple ways. And so I think that the activity of designing a historical game in many ways is like that of writing a history, right? It's, it's, it's an attempt to create an interpretation of evidence, merely a, a creative rather than an, like an academic interpretation of evidence. The difference is the criteria that the historian applies to the sources compared to the criteria that a game designer applies to the sources. So both are attempting to select interpretations that are plausible, but one is also applying these other uh, criteria, these other lenses of enjoyment and playability and variety and so forth, right? If I think that the uh, that, that Harald Saga is an account of the Sicilian campaign that's accurate, it's not going to bother me that all four episodes are the same. I'm just going to say, yeah, it was repetitive. But as a game designer, I have a different priority. So um, historical game design, like historical play, is therefore an act of imaginative recreation of the past. You know, not a necessarily a simulation, but a, 
a recreation, I almost said recreation, of course it is recreation, um, based on evidence, you know, like a simulation, but with certain other criteria used to assess that evidence. Um, and I think one of the best ways that you can make those acts of historical recreation, you know, more informed and more enjoyable is to involve the player in that process of interpretation. So, you know, including the sources, talking about how we've interpreted those sources, um, you know, it makes the player a, a part of that um, of that process, rather than merely a kind of passive recipient of some uh, authority that I don't think most historians would necessarily uh, claim to have. Um, oh, well, this is all just a, sorry, this is what I want to give this live. We needed all of our um, uh, social media stuff, but uh, you're already here. So, um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's um, what, you know, that, that's how I guess we went about turning the history that um, John Luca told you about into the scenarios that are presented in the book. And that's what sort of, not to say that we necessarily sat down and uh, like applied those processes as a sort of step-by-step -step thing, but kind of going back and looking at it, that's my reconstruction um, of how it worked. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, James. And thank you. Thank you all. And thank you to everyone for being here for us with us for about an hour and a half now. As I said at the beginning, now we will be starting our Q&A session. So please feel free to leave comments, feedback, questions in the chat, and I will read them out. Please be do, do be mindful of the fact that the questions will remain on the live recording itself, which will remain on YouTube. Uh, so it will be recorded. Also, please be mindful that there is a slight delay of about a minute in between the questions and the live stream. So do bear that in mind if you don't happen to respond quite instantaneously. Uh, feel free to answer to put the questions now and I will just read them one by one and then we can answer them together. Any any other comments from from uh, the others on, on the, the presentations themselves and the talks themselves before we get started with the Q&A? Well, I enjoyed listening to both because I couldn't make it to Leeds, so it's um, it's always interesting to hear other people's perspective on the the project that we worked on. Well, I mean, even though I was in Leeds, uh, you know, uh, I didn't get to hear John Lucas' uh, presentation when he made wow. it. So actually, this is a this is a first for me as well. We um, all learned something today. That's right. I was I was out in the gallery. Yes, um, James and I today gave the presentations that uh, we gave at the Royal Armories on the twenty fifth of September. Yeah, uh, I wasn't able to to attend any of the presentations or any of the festivities because I was also helping out with the, the actual stands and the games and uh, uh, the other colleagues. <clears throat> In any case, for more information on uh, on the book launch and everything that has to do with the book, you'll find more links in the description. Like James mentioned, that's where you'll find our social medias, our website, our blog, and everything that li really has to do. Uh, has to do with the game and the book itself. That's where you'll be able to buy it. You'll you can buy it from uh, uh, the UK, the US, Germany, France, Italy. Correct me if I'm wrong, John. Look up, but I think those are all the countries that we have official retailers with. And you can also purchase uh, a, a digital version of the book as well as a physical version of the book. And uh, yeah. Um. So uh, now wh while we're waiting for. Um, questions from uh, from YouTube to filter through. Mm -hmm. um, we did get a question uh, on our Facebook page. Yeah, um, go for it. Yeah, that, uh, that that I thought. Yeah, so this uh, this comes from uh, from Paul Bright, um, and Paul asks, "Do you see the book as an academic work of historical fact or a gaming manual? Um, and where did you draw the line between the two? Now, uh, John Luca, you approached this. Uh, you, you did answer this in the in the Facebook comment, but I thought that you know it might be." Um, uh, it, it might be worth talking about on here as well, because I think it's very relevant to what you were talking about earlier. Yes, um, I think it's a kind of hybrid uh, between the two. Um, it's an hybrid between a game and um, uh, academic research, um, to the point that, as I mentioned, this is uh, now kickstarting a, uh, an international academic project. In yeah. Sense, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go on. No, I was going to say, I mean, because I think that that's, you know, that was what I wanted to to mention, because I think in general, when people think about the interaction between historical research and gaming, they think it's it's necessarily a one 
direction thing, right? That that the research will necessarily inform the game, but that there are no other. But you know, here in fact, the 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 questions that the game raises uh, actually wind up inspiring research. Yeah. Um, Essentially, I would like to describe it as a kind of immersive experience that is informed and it is informing uh, an ongoing research project. Because basically, um, a, it was a research project that gave the idea uh, and a game, because it was Crusader States also that gave the, uh, the idea. But while we design it, we also, um, the designing process is um, raising questions. Uh, that uh, you know are are leading to uh, new fresh research to be conducted. Um, all the for the for example the the campaign to the Holy Land. We only know that uh, Harald fought against bandits between uh, Jerusalem and the River Jordan. Uh, it doesn't say who, who were these bandits. It doesn't say that the uh, Fatimids supported the, the the campaign, but they must have had supported the campaign because. Harald wouldn't have been allowed. Wouldn't have been allowed to go to the Holy Land as an armed pilgrimage if the Fatimids, uh, had, you know, uh, had, uh, uh, had been against it. And it was uh, as part of a. We know that the Byzantines and the Fatimids had an agreement. So we we had to um, do some background research uh, on that and of the kind of banditry that you could find in the Holy Land uh, in that period, uh, which revealed and opened up a, a fantastic, uh, incredibly fascinating. Uh, um context yeah uh, i learned a lot from that section event. actually yeah. you know i i had no idea about the the sort of um the the existence of this tradition of um you know you know of kind of poet bandits um within uh, within the islamic literature so i thought i thought that was a, a like a i mean i you know i thought I, like i came in saying oh yeah well you know i know about harald saga you know i understand all this kind of viking stuff and then actually if if you if you read the current books on uh, my biography of uh, biographies of Aral Aldrada, they don't touch the uh, medieval banditry uh, bit at all. But it's something that we had to include and we had to, to do research because when we looked at the uh, at the setting, so we give me five uh, these bits and they talk about bandits. So who are these bandits? Um, how can we represent them? Um, and then uh, you know. Now that bits is going to be incorporated in uh, in the um, international research project on uh, on on Harald, uh, I think that you know it wouldn't. Uh, there is no chance that medieval uh, Islamic, uh, I mean uh, Middle Eastern banditry would have been included in an academic research project on Harald Aldrada if it wasn't because we had to uh, flesh out uh, yeah. his opponents in the game. Right. We we, we you you couldn't uh, you couldn't have all this detail about one of the antagonists and none about the other one. Yes. Um, exactly. Yeah, and, and there was some, um, you know, but at the same time though, I think that there are limitations. So, you know, in some ways it, it, I feel like writing a, you know, a work of historical gaming, it falls within the category of sort of, um, it's writing popular history, I guess, you know, it's like writing, um, you know, writing history for the general reader rather than writing academic history. So like one thing, for instance, that we did not include, you know, you mentioned the battle of Stiklestad in, um, in 1030 but there is some debate about like whether the battle of Stiklestad happened um you know i sources for what happens to olaf are are actually you know they're, they're in conflict like it, there are different accounts of uh, of how his attempt to reclaim the throne of norway is defeated but if we pursued every detail to the extent that it could be pursued the book would be enormous you know, it would just so we so we have to make these decisions, and they are all kind of subjective decisions about what what does and what doesn't get included. And uh, I think, in terms of the purpose of the book, maybe the criteria that we use to make those decisions are different, right? So there are things that we you know that we put in because they were fun and and we want you know like like the bandits, right? This this whole colorful new thing, whereas historical debate about what the sources say about a thing, you know, that's not necessarily exactly relevant to the point of the game would maybe just kind of muddy the waters a bit too much. No, I totally agree. And um, the case of the Holy Land also, um, we we introduced um, to this game something that was not in Crusader States, which is 
uh, historical characters, historical leaders with their skills based on uh, their back history. Uh, in the case of the Holy Land, is the only one in which we had to create a plausible but fictional mm -hmm. uh, nemesis. In the and um, but is a nemesis that is uh, an ideal type of uh, historical bandits as portrayed in uh, uh, in uh, in um, medieval uh, medieval literature. Right, and you've uh, talked about the kind of the, the the particular sources that that character is inspired by. Yes, exactly. You, you're sort of using this fictional character as a way to point back to this literature that he derives from. Correct. Yes, um, medieval chronicles, but poetry, uh, and um, it is a fascinating character. Um, it is fictional, but as I said, entirely plausible because it is a, uh, it, it is a, a, an amalgamation of historical characters and other uh, mm -hmm. historical mm -hmm. evidence that we have from the. From, from the um, so I see that we are actually now. Uh, yeah. We've got we've got we, a pretty we good. Do have, questions. Yeah, we we do have quite a few uh, quite a few questions indeed. Yes, and I'll be uh, we'll be going through them one by one. So the first question comes from Scattered Dice, and they ask, my question regards the presence of such colorful characters like Harald and others in these historical events. Does this book deviate from the core rules where, in my view, leaders have less agency? Yeah, I think he's got a, a follow-up comment just, to really... that just below. Let's, the, oh, let's let that Dan go. This yeah, time. go on, Dan. Yeah. You're the expert. Yeah. Luca, you kind of just mentioned that, um, the way that new characters have been introduced into into this book. So did you want to say a little bit more about about how they work here? Um, yes, well, uh, we took the um, uh, table of skills, uh, leader skills from uh, uh, the original Lion Rampant, but also Dragon Rampant, uh, and the forthcoming second edition. And um, we look at the backstory of the characters to see um, uh, the, the, the most appropriate leader's uh, skills uh, that uh, that we do, could find. So I'm not sure if it um, adds uh, agency uh, to these characters that uh, was not there in the book. I don't know uh, how, how many people playing Lion Rampant used uh, uh, the leader skills, uh, but in this case, I thought it was it, it was a good idea to uh, uh, cast some light and to focus on that because uh, uh, we have these um, uh, colorful and fantastic characters from Harald's time. And uh, I, I thought that their backstories fit very well some of these uh, leader skills that are originally in the book. So we didn't invent new leader skills. We used the, uh, really, already existing ones. But what we did was to pair them for the first time, as far as I know, with historical characters. Um, yes, yeah, so that's the key thing, I think. That they're not randomized anymore. In the, in the original yeah. game, you would roll um to see to see what random skill your leader had whereas now we've kind of tried to match up those gaming mechanisms with what we know or have have decided about the the different characters in the book but one of the things that that means is that it's very easy to play those scenarios not using those characters right like there's you know the, the scenario will not change in any way if you just say well instead of Harald Tarjad I want my own Varangian commander and I'll roll randomly for his leadership skill you know you, you do that and then it's otherwise exactly the same yes and uh, you can then extrapolate to take away those uh, scenarios and play them uh, in any kind of high medieval uh, air, um, a medieval game around the Mediterranean. And honest. that was one of the things that we said, actually, like a lot during the, the writing process was that wherever possible, we tried to approach the source material with the tools that we already had in what was already in line rampant. So with leader skills or with glory or with whatever, right? So that, that we would, um, you know, uh, that, that uh, there's a minimum of introduction of new mechanics. So... I guess uh, the answer, therefore, is no. Um, it's <laughs> it's pretty consistent with the core rules. Those those characters are a high ratio of historical background to mechanical difference. I would, I, one could argue that it adds a little adds a little bit of um, uh, role playing mm. elements, uh, historical role playing elements, but. Um... Is, if you if you want to give more color and to uh, to do it by um, including individuals and um, I'll, I, I I've come to like biographies uh, and you know the role of individuals in history uh, and uh, because of that interest of mine as well uh, I think that that would 
was one of the things that inspired it. But uh, I also I'm also a role playing gamer myself. Uh, I like to have characters. I think it gives a little bit of the personal touch to it. Before we move on to the to the next question, I want to add that if you have a question for anyone in particular, please do mention it. Question for Dan or for James, and we'll do our best to answer your question in any way. Uh, the next question comes from Joe Megafan, and they ask, "Do you think the Lion Rampant rule set particularly useful as a starting point, uh, and if so, why?" I would say that is because of this flexibility, uh, and um, it, 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 okay, that is the reason why I was interested in it and why I contacted uh, uh, Dan in the first place. Um, they're uh, easy to learn, easy to implement, and incredibly flexible. Um, and um, they can be um, modified with, uh, easily, I, I, I think, without breaking the system. And you can uh, adapt them to, uh, you can tweak them um, to, uh, for, for different uh, um, historical periods and for different needs. It's but definitely that something that we saw, I think, when we were doing those sort of participatory events. So whether that was, um, you know, for, for the previous project for Lion Ramp Crusader States, we did the, the games at, at Claymore, um, when we ran our game at Salute, or most recently at the Royal Armories, um, where particularly the Royal Armories, right, where we were in a museum context, we weren't at a war games show, we had people, we had one player who um, came up to me after the game and told me that it was her first uh, war game, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that now she was interested in historical war gaming. Um, so I think that that level of, you know, when you're trying to have something that, uh, is, you know, is both for like, there were people there who were interested in wargaming and there were people who were interested in medieval history who maybe, you know, didn't necessarily know that much about wargaming. And I think having a game that was so approachable, right. The, you know, the, the, the entire army list was on one page, you know, you needed two sets of dice. It's all was the same. Thing. I think that that was, uh, that was a big factor in terms of uh, making it possible for people to participate. And that was really, you know, the whole point in writing Line Rampant to begin with was, was just to create a, a fairly simple to follow set of rules. So it could be used as an introductory one or just for gamers if they didn't, didn't really want to start crunching numbers in their head. And I, I, I think sometimes the uh, less complicated the rules are the more you can manipulate the rules that are there to suit what you need so for example we've just been saying we've there are some new rules in this supplement but a lot of it is really looking at the framework that's already there and working out how that applies to the subject matter that we're looking at but i th i think james and luca i think you think i'm right in saying for the crusader states you looked at some other rule sets as well i think didn't you 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 you, yeah, you played we, quite a few diff different well, games. Well, the, the yeah, the we Luca turned up to one of our meetings with a like a huge stack of uh, of uh, of medieval war games. That's right. We we went through and and we we tried out. Yeah, we tried. I mean, we eliminated some uh, just in terms of their you know their scale or their scope wasn't what we were looking for, and we tried out some other ones. Um, and uh, but you had started out, John Luca. You did use line rampant for your. Um, Battle of Lodi Vecchio project, which is really the kind of the the the, the ancestor of this whole thing. So it was something that you were already familiar with. Yes, yes. Um, it was about an, uh, a battle in northern Italy. So uh, um, I had already tried to experiment with uh, with, with that um, a couple of years before Crusader Crusader States. Um, before I met uh, before I met Dan. And that was, you know, the knowledge of the game that uh, um, made me to approach uh, uh, approach Dan. Th th there are some new rules, but they are mainly upgrades, so they are, they don't change the mechanics. Um, hmm. It simply thinks that um, some new ideas, like buying terrain upgrades, you can change. The players can change the battleground if they want, like they have prepared the ditch or. Uh, used caltrops or um, things like that. Um, there are some new rules to that, that reflect uh, 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 warfare in, in that particular uh, area and geographical area, um, time and geographical area, uh, like shield wall, especially used by the Varangians, uh, for example, uh, or feigned retreat. 
uh, which was uh, a trick that was used uh, not exclusively but uh, often by the by the Normans um, or trying to fight uh, or, or fighting with javelins for cavalry, not only the light cavalry, uh, which was a way uh, in which um, heavy and elite cavalry fought uh, at the beginning of the 11th century as portrayed still in the bio tapestry. So we added the little elements, but you know they are they are tricks. So we are, as Dan, uh, Dan mentioned, we uh, adapt mostly or tweak existing rules. And some of those rules as well come. We've kind of pulled them forward from my my second edition. So you mentioned the shield wall rules there, and and some others surrounding that. These are rules that are all going to be in the second edition of the game, but we're kind of I suppose previewing them now because they're relevant to to this supplement. Mm -hmm. yeah. Marshall also uh, uh, agrees and says that the rules are so flexible and comprise simple building blocks allow you for adding or changing uh, rules to fit your to fit your style. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's definitely what we found. Yeah, I mean, that, that was kind of like a, a big part of designing them in the first place. I've, I've never been a games designer that, that writes the rules and then thinks that you should doggedly follow them whether you enjoy them or not. I tried to give you a framework of rules that you can use and change the bits and pieces that you want to. So, you know, it's, there's there's a lot of flexibility there, I think. Yeah, which is what uh, the things I love about Lion Rampant. Yeah. Our next question comes from LoKB, and they ask, were the Varangand only Vikings in exile living as mercenaries? And how many men did Harold bring from Norway slash Scandinavia? So we know that he moved from Kievar Rus to Byzantium with 500 men. But there was also, and but James will be able to explain that better than me, also coming and going of people from Scandinavia. Yeah, now, that's, well... The definition as mercenaries, uh, they are mercenaries, yes, but their relationship with Byzantium is incredibly fascinating because uh, you can see how Byzantium soft powers was, power was so effective that it was felt in Iceland, as far as way as Iceland at the time. So, they, yes, they were mercenaries, paid soldiers, but, and, uh, but they considered the Byzantine emperor as the most important uh, um, ruler in Western Christendom. And uh, even in Iceland, they knew that they belonged to... No, Western Christendom. Uh, they belonged to this kind of family of nations and family of people uh, which were brought together by a common religion and they knew that the Byzantine emperor, or they perceived the Byzantine emperor as the most prestigious ruler in Christendom. So in a way, they were mercenary, paid by paid soldiers. In the service, however, of someone who re they recognized as a kind of over ultimate overlord, at least in theory. Um, and also where, there's that, yeah. that element of the ranging guard being established, you know, as part of a treaty relationship between the Byzantines and Kiev and Rus, right? Where there's almost an obligation on the Byzantine part to hire uh, people. So, I mean, so they're mercenaries in a sense, and you'll definitely read people refer to them as mercenaries in the sense that they're people who p fight for pay rather than out of a legal obligation. But yes. I don't know that they're mercenaries in the kind of like soldier of fortune sense that that word brings to mind today. Exactly. And that is very important to consider in the sense that the Varangians never changed sides. The Varangians only fought in the Mediterranean for the Byzantines. You never, you don't see them switching sides to the Normans, the Southern Italians or Muslim forces, which is something that really struck me and something that we will discuss in, in, the, in the project. Uh, that is especially clear if you compare them with the Normans. The Normans is, are the, the kind of mercenaries that you use that you that, that, that you might expect today, the Normans change sides continuously. Mm -hmm. And uh, those who fought for the Byzantines, they tended to be murdered by the Byzantines because of that. Um, the, the Normans in southern Italy changed sides continuously between the Lombard princes, among the Lombard princes, from the Lombard princes to the Byzantines, and then for, from the Byzantine rulers. And then they go in the Middle East and they uh, on, uh, in Anatolia in the service of the Byzantines. And then they fight against the Byzantines because they want to establish their own principalities. The Varangians don't do that. The Varangians might take part in civil wars, but they always and only side with the Byzantine emperor, and that is their 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 strength. But yeah, they, they, they there was a kind of establish war. their own polity. Yes, exactly. But there is a, a lot of time coming and going. So he went there with five hundred people. 
some of them might have left, some of them might have come. Uh, also, they were Vikings, but they were also uh, Rus. They came, many of them came from uh, Kievan Rus, some from Iceland, uh, some from Denmark, some from Norway, from, some from Sweden, in fact. Harald is Nor was Norwegian, but we have these, uh, the, most of the runestones, surviving runestones are from Sweden. And as we argue in, uh, in, the, uh, in, in Viking in the Sun, uh, he probably had his own, as his service, uh, locals like Byzantines uh, and um, Italians who simply joined, the, the, um, jo joined the, his troops when they were needed. Uh, I don't know if any of you have read uh, um, Tartredov. Uh, book about Vaida Videssos. Yeah, it's uh, a sort of uh, fantasy version of the Byzantine Empire. Yeah, exactly. There is a group of Roman mercenaries uh, and they recruit locals when they started to lose troops and when it's needed. Uh, I think they, they, they did exactly the same. And I think you, 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 you reported that for the Sicilian campaign, James. Yeah, right. So, I mean, the Harald Saga absolutely says that, that Harald is kind of leaving this autonomous detachment, but it says that he's got Normans. In the, well, it says Latin. But we can assume that means Normans or Lombards. Um, the, the Normans in the Sicilian campaign are fighting on behalf of the Prince of Salerno. Um, and, uh, but it also says that he has Greek troops in his retinue. So whether they were members of the Varangian Guard or not is a, a vexed question. I, I think the, the question about whether they're Vikings in exile kind of is, is twofold, right? First, what do we mean by Vikings? And second, what do we mean by exile? The like ethnonyms in this era, particularly from the Greek sources, I, you know, who knows? The um, when the Russian Primary Chronicle talks about what a Rus is, it says that they're Varangians who are called Russes, just as other Varangians are called Angles, Normans, Goths, Swedes, and Danes, for they are thus named, which is extremely unhelpful because they're called that because that's what they're called. To um, be fair to the question asked, they did also mention Vikings and ex exile in quotation marks. Yeah, well, no, exactly. I mean, I think I think those are very well placed quotation marks. Um, but at the same time, I don't know that it's it's exile because, again, these are high medieval sources. So I don't know how accurate a picture of the 11th century they paint. But if you look at how the Varangian Guard is treated in Icelandic sagas, sometimes people go there when they're outlawed in Iceland. And, you know, they, they, they go and live as a mercenary for a while until the heat dies down because outlawry could sometimes be for a specific period of time, um, although sometimes it could be permanent. But there are other cases. So like um, uh, Thorstein Dromund goes to Constantinople because he's, per he's seeking vengeance against a man who has joined the Varangian Guard. And it's and um, when um, Boli Bolason serves in the Guard and returns to Iceland, he's regarded as quite the hero. Like this is this very impressive thing and, and everyone talks about how well dressed he is um there's a there's a one of the um uh one of the illustrations that uh, that that osprey kindly um uh let us use it actually includes an image that's that's very clearly based on um the description of bully bolison in uh in lockstall saga um so i don't know that it's necessarily always exile because it's often quite prestigious, although maybe I should just say that what we might call exile is a, is a comparatively regular feature of Scandinavian and Icelandic politics. Well, Harald was a um, kind of exile, and uh, many of his followers were rather uh, uh, people who were close to his brother Olaf, and when Olaf was uh, defeated, they, they had to leave, essentially. Yeah, but like, but so for example, like if you consider his two named... Um, you know, lieutenants in the saga, Ulf Osbaksen and Haldor Snorrason, they're, I mean, yes, they probably can't go back to Norway, but they're not from Norway. Mm. You know, nothing would stop them going back to Iceland. Um, except this is a, you know, being in the Varangian Guard and, and you know, amassing glory, experience and riches is a, it's a tempting prospect. You know, you're, you're going you're gonna to get rich faster in Constantinople than in Iceland. Yeah, absolutely. For our next question, uh, Badger asks, is it a two-way street in that as well as providing an unusually extensive background for gamers, the book and the Crusader States, the, the book being Viking in the Sun, has attracted academics into the world of historical games? Yes. Um, well, it's attracting the interest here in the Eastern Games Lab, but uh, for the next project also, uh, there will be uh, more... Uh, 
uh, uh, academics uh, uh, in, in, involved uh, uh, involved in that as well. I think there's been uh, like the last few years have seen maybe like a higher level of academic participation in discussion of historical gaming, but so far, that's mainly we're talking about digital gaming primarily. Um, and I think that that's, I mean, hopefully, you know, hopefully that's starting to change. Um, uh, I, I mean, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know how much we can say. I've, I've certainly had a few academics get in touch with me aside from, from the team here. Um, I, I, it seems to me as an out, outsider in academia that it's, it's something that academics are starting to kind of see there's some use for within within their own realms, and they're kind of feeling the way forward. I think it's, I think it's really linked to the fact that games are now just so much part of our culture, be it board games, games on your phone, you know, wherever you're playing them, it's a much bigger part of general life now. So I think more people are are used to the idea that you can be using a game in some way to explore something or to publicise something. So yeah, I mean, I, I think that's that is that's a growing area. There's always been, I think, a level of overlap in the hobby space. So, for example, I remember in the early 2000s reading an article in War Games Illustrated by a very prominent early medievalist. Um, but in a, in a purely hobbyist um, uh, perspective, right? I mean, using his historical knowledge, but certainly not uh you know but but just just arguing against what he saw as a common misconception in sort of historical rules lists and there are other examples but it hasn't i don't think it's been organized in any way until you know comparatively recently maybe the um maybe a a, a generation of uh, of people raised on games now in positions where they get to make these kind of decisions yeah very interesting to to consider especially with you know all the news about gaming and all the spaces yes general but, but it's definitely a two way um at least for for at least what we do because as i said it's not that we uh, take historical um research and we make a game out of it but uh, it is the game who is that is inspiring academic research as well so it's yeah. definitely a two way street yeah in that for, respect. Uh... For our last question before we wrap up, because it has almost been uh, two hours for us, um, Marshall asks, Marshall Mahurin asks, uh, plans for additional books? And I know we've just touched on this, but do we have any plans for uh, additional projects, if not necessarily books? What can people look forward to from Dan and for, from James, from Gianluca and from the rest uh, of, the, of the lab? Well, um, I have, as, as I've mentioned, I've got the second edition of Lion Rampant coming out next year, um, which is going to push the period back to the, the fall of Rome. So, you know, the, the Harold book is going to fit in really well there. Um, I have some other um, projects lined up with Osprey and a few other people as well, uh, covering my uh, kind of favourite periods of history to mostly early medieval and a science fiction game as well um that's that's me keeping me busy well regarding the eastern games lab um i can already say that the next one uh, on which we are working with a student uh, a former student now he just graduated um uh, eric uh is uh, uh not for lion rampant but for the men will be kings uh and uh, it, it moves the action to the sasuma rebellion in uh, 19th century japan uh, should be out next year uh, and then we have another we are discussing another lion rampant project but i cannot reveal uh, at the moment it's too early to reveal uh, the topic but uh, watch this uh, space for further announcements exactly yes we, it will be i can i can say that uh it will be a multi-authored uh book so these are all the three authors the next one will have six uh so uh watch this space yeah, perfect then. Uh, let's see, there's a, a comment from Joe Megafan who says, hope the uh, intro music was the Harald, the Hadrada Saga Raga. Slightly because of copyright, I'm not sure if we were actually allowed to use that, but I did have some Viking-inspired music at the beginning of the live stream for everyone to uh, to enjoy. Uh, before we wrap up, are there any final comments, final thoughts from, from either the others or from, from, uh, from the audience? 
Well, we're gonna have to wait about a minute for the audience. Yeah, I know. Uh, this so, is, yeah. This, uh, <laughs> in the meanwhile, we can say also say that uh, James is working on uh, how to use uh, Lion Rampant on Roll Twenty and oh, other. Yeah, platforms. that's right. Yeah, yeah. The the the, the digital content collection. Um, so right over lockdown, one of the things that we've been doing a lot of is playing um, playing Lion Rampant online, um, and uh, we've been um, well. I, I've been uh, I've been working on um, a set of resources intended to make that. Um, you know, easier for people who uh, want to play, particularly Crusader States, um, on uh, virtual tabletops. Um, so we've got some maps in there, um, and I've been uh, I've been building um, uh, counter collections out of the wealth of uh, digitized medieval manuscripts now available to uh, to everyone. We we live in a golden age of, uh, of digital medieval resources. I gotta say. Um, but uh, but yeah, so you know, again, uh, something that we have, uh, we'll have a, an announcement for coming up pretty soon, and indeed, um, probably should have already. But that's my fault. Um, and uh, and we will organize a kind of uh, online playtest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do some. We'll we'll uh, we'll do some online gaming. If I'm going to go around claiming that it's easy, then uh, I should uh, I should back that up. Yeah. So. You know, watch this space for more news on that live stream itself. We have comments from Marshall thanking us for the stream, the Shiro as well. Thank you very much, obviously, to to everyone who's been a part to the audience, to the audience. Um, for anything that has to do with the lab itself, oh, you have links to the description, to the Instagram, to the Twitter, to the link tree, which includes links to where to buy the books, to uh, to everything that we do really. Um, and thank you again for, for for joining us on YouTube for again nearly two hours. This is a, our, our premiere live stream, so I do apologize. There were definitely some visual glitches, some audio glitches. Hopefully, as we get more experience in this arena, it would get it will get better. Uh, also, it is delightful to see that we are one subscriber away for 150 subscribers, which is which is really good news for a brand new channel that we launched about a, about a year ago. Launch, um, launched obviously. Uh, recently, obviously, relative to to the work we put in. Thank you so much, James. Thank you so much, Gianluca. Thank you so much, uh, Dan, for your presentation. And thank you so much uh, again to everyone who who uh, who was here for us and with us. And uh, hoping that everyone has uh, has a lovely lovely evening. And yeah, game on. Yeah, thank you so thank much you for moderating. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. All right. Thank you.